Hello and welcome to CB Defense Today. I'm Jack Bunja, Public Affairs Specialist for the U.S. Army DEVCOM Chemical Biological Center. CB Defense Today is a quarterly interview show where we sit down with DOD experts to talk about topics relevant to chemical and biological defense. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Pocket Detection Pouch, or PDP. Now, the PDP is an easily readable detection platform which allows folks to detect potentially hazardous liquids, powdered chemicals, drugs, toxic materials, radiation, and explosives. And my guests this week are integral into the development of the PDP. First, we have Dr. Jennifer Sikowski. She is one of the inventors of the PDP, and she is also a molecular toxicologist here at the center. And with her, we have uh, Yusef Enriquez. He is the founder and CEO of uh, Indigenous AI, a company that is partnering with the center in the development of the PDP. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you for having us. So, Dr. Skowski, we're going to talk to you. So, talk to me just a little bit about how the development of the pocket detection pouch began. Well, it really was the brainchild of my co-founder, co-inventor, uh, Kelly Betts. She is uh, the wife of a warfighter, also a biologist. And she saw her husband taking uh, supplies out into the field, already carrying a very heavy ruck, you know, and she thought, well, I'm in the business of developing assays at work. Why can't we make assays that are lighter, faster, eye-readable, and put them in a bag? Why can't an assay? Why does it have to be in a tube? So she got her seal meal out and uh, some bags and started doing prototypes in the kitchen with sandwich bags. Okay, so <laughs> she came up with the original idea. Just in conversation at work, we are talking about some you know, new ideas we, we could try. We knew we had an opportunity to get some internal funding. So we pitched the idea of this pocket detection pouch and won some funding, 50K. We had six months to turn a prototype around. So we got to work uh, in the lab with a you know, more advanced seal meal and <laughs> different types of polymers. And uh, through many iterations, came up with the first pocket detection pouch in the lab here. Um, we, were all, we were tasked in our internal funding to look specifically first at whether we could detect fentanyl. Okay. Um, obviously a, a, a threat to civilians and warfighters alike. So by taking a swab off of a surface and putting it in this pouch and adding a small amount of liquid, sealing it and pushing that liquid through the bag, the liquid can then hit the bottom of these assay tickets that are called lateral flow assays. So there's a wick at the bottom of these. And the liquid containing the fentanyl or whatever material will wick up and give a yes, no, eye readable answer within about 15 minutes. Now this technology, the, 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 the wicks and the, the assays, that, they've been around for a long time. Absolutely. Right? So the whole, the whole core to pocket detection pouch, how this got started is that you could put anything in this. This is, we, we refer to it as the lunchbox. It's really sure. just the magic that happens is really just in the architecture of how the PDP works. So there's an inner compartment and outer compartment Department that keeps whatever assays you want safe and dry until time that you put this, the uh, the sample in and the sample touches just the wicking part of the assay. It also could carry colorimetric papers that get wicked all the way through the paper, um, and like you mentioned, it can also be used to house other assays such as detection of radiation or explosives, and in that case the explosive detection actually will happen outside of the bag for safety reasons. So the ticket oh. actually can come out of this. Um, so that's, that's how the, the idea got started. And that was the uh, initial uh, focus was these lateral flow assays for fentanyl. Wonderful. So, so, so with that design, it, it, it allows us to really, it translates to the field well, right? For, for both soldiers, first responders and Absolutely, absolutely, and th that's the whole point. Is it's low, low size, weight, and power. Low swap. It's right. small enough to fit in a pocket. A warfighter or anyone could carry, you know, tens of these in their pocket mm -hmm. or in their <clears throat> in their pants pocket, and really have no additional burden. Right, and it's an early warning, it. right? So an, they can absolutely. So it's an early warning. They could have it just in case, right. and it really doesn't add an extra burden in case they need it, or they can be built specifically for the mission they're on. So they know they're going to potentially run into a biohazard. Maybe we'll fill them with bioassays or chem or in this, you know, dr street drugs like fentanyl. 
Um, so it, it's applicable to pretty much anything that they could run into. Absolutely, in any it's in incredibly flexible. Really, just depends on what assays you want to put in here. Um, one other key, I'll just say real quick in the beginning. We really wanted to make sure the warfighters were in, in the loop and giving us feedback. So we had the advantage here at CBC of having um, a military person in, in our staff, Sergeant First Class Olson, who was very instrumental in getting this in the hands of other warfighters. Our, our training group was really inf influential. Uh, Dr. Carrie Poor getting it in front of uh, civil support teams and getting feedback right away. What do you like about this? What do you wish it could do differently? And one of the things we learned that influenced this part, this is, they call this a buddy tab. The civil support team said, you know, if we had a bag in the field, we're gonna put duct tape on either side of that bag. So when we have our heavy gloves on, we can open up that bag really easily, put our sample in. So that actually is the, uh, the beginning of this flap. So this buddy tab flap allows someone to pull this open easily. And then, not only is it a tab, it's, it's the flap that's, that seals it down. Okay. So I just, that was really key to make sure that our end user will actually want this when we're done developing. I mean, that's the most important part, is right. making sure this translates to the folks that need to use it the most. So that, that's fantastic. So what about this is, I, I mean, the technology has existed for a long time, and, and, and obviously, plastic bags are not new, right. but this is still unique for the warfighter, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we at the center invent some really high tech, really incredibly sensitive mm -hmm. detection materials, and you know, that, that's a lot of our mission. But this is a very low tech solution that can meet the need when a presumptive ID is all you need. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is, this is a low tech solution that doesn't, well, it exists now. It didn't exist before. <laughs> um, there are other holders of lateral flow assays, but they're not small and flexible mm. and this lightweight. So that's, that's a, a, an additional advantage we have over right. other mm -hmm. holders of lateral flow assays. And reducing the burden is so important. So yeah. that's fantastic. So, and Yousef, you know, now your company, Indigenous AI came into the picture. So talk to me first a little bit about your company background, you know, and how you got connected right. to this type of product. Yeah, no, um, you know, been interesting ride with you know, learning about the pocket detection pouch. I actually, my last government position was working for SAIC as a contractor for Defense Threat Reduction Agency okay, um, right. in early 2017, 2018. And so got the opportunity to meet Dr. Moore uh, who was running the center there. Uh, well, well, yeah, and Dr. Moore was also our previous director. Yes, right, so, right. so, wonderful. <laughs> so that's the connection. Um, yeah, we had good conversations around, you know, the mission of what, you know, DEVCOM, CBC was doing. And so, you know, when COVID happened, uh, I reached out to them because they were, uh, Operation Warp Speed had launched and there were requests for a different technology that could help with the COVID detection. So as you can imagine, middle of uh, 2020, everybody's scrambling to look for materials and technology that could help with the detection, early prevention, and early detection of, of the COVID. Um, and so, you know, as I started to go through an NIH uh, submission, thought about Dr. Moore and the interesting conversations we had had previously and reached out to him, uh, asking if there were any uh, technology that could uh, help um, develop and help with the rapid detection. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of the technology that he suggested that I look into. So contacted, well, he made the connection with uh, Matthew Jones, who's uh, um, part of the organization here. He's in our technology He's transfer tech office. Transfer yes. office. And so, yeah, we ended up talking uh, all over Zoom, middle of COVID, <laughs> no, no uh, person in-person <laughs> meetings. And uh, yeah, really believed in what I was doing two folds. One, right, public, pandemics going on, but also, I was also a medic in the military. Okay. So I completely understood the burden of dragging around heavy equipment. Uh, and so saw that dual use technology capability that is uh, highly needed uh, within the, you know, the warfighter, protecting the warfighter, but also for first responder, firefighters. Oh, so, so yeah, no, the, the uh, product appealed to me. Um, I ended up uh, setting up an entity to do the tech transfer. Uh, and worked on it. The only problem that occurred was that 
the ability to scale a lot of the materials, given that we were shut down, we didn't have the opportunity to kind of commercialize the idea. And so uh, Warp Speed was looking for technology that could scale uh, immediately with the, all the parts within the United States because we were kind of shut down from the world. Uh, but kept, I kept um, fighting on, on making sure that I wanted to see the technology because I knew how important it was for our war fighters. And so that gave me the opportunity later on. I uh, ran into uh, Matthew Jones at the Bio Conference last year in, in uh, San Diego. And so I looked, I was looking for him, and I said, I wonder if Mr. Jones is here. And somebody tapped me and said, hey, how's it going? <laughs> you see, and he's like, I know you. And I was like, you know, I was just looking for you. And he was like, yeah, you know, we had a good run. Uh, I think and I said, no, I still have interest in the, in the pocket detection pouch. Um, let's set up a meeting. And that's how we ended up getting to here. Indigenous, which is the new entity that I had formed, uh, started looking at dual use technology for the military because I had just got into a high profile um, accelerator program at the Johnson & Johnson J Labs here that's in Washington, D.C. And they have a partnership with BARDA and these are the type of technologies they're looking to scale uh, from, you know, MVP or pilot, uh, you know, a prototype. And so now we're in discussions with moving this product within commercialization and getting some additional funding to build out what, you know, Dr. Sikowski and her partner had started. That, that's fantastic. I mean, a partnership is the key to making sure a lot of this stuff uh, actually can make it into the hands of the people that need it the most. Yes, yes. So so as a as a partner, you know, you've mentioned a little bit about where you're going, but what are your goals? So this working with Johnson & Johnson is yeah. going to obviously be a great help. Yeah, no, look, it's um, the way the system is set up. I mean, Dr. Sikowski and her team has done all they could do with the, the funding that they've gotten from the, the, the organization. And then there's other groups like BARDA who know how to scale these things and have the funding. Okay. And so because we're a Johnson & Johnson J-Labs company, that now puts us in that arena to go out and get additional funding to build out uh, the prototype and make it a little bit more robust, add some new features to it, working with the CBC team. So that's where we developed the CRADA. So we have a collaborative research agreement with CBC and the company so that we can think about you know, what the next, this version looks like and the future version once we start getting into the hands of the warfighter. And so from your experience, it's, you know, obviously doing this through COVID, right. <laughs> you know, it, it challenges abound, right? But, but you were able to do and get this far. So would you recommend other small businesses look to, to government organizations for, for potentials and partnerships to work specifically with the Army and agencies such as organizations such as uh, CBC? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm a big supporter of it. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a war fight, previous warfighter myself, so um, I've always looked at, you know, and I'm a medic, so I'm always looking for ways that we could, you know, be able to, you know, provide those guys with the, the, the most high technology, low, low code, you know, things that we could use in the field. Um, and so this is a perfect example of how that public-private partnership could come together, taking something that's already, you know, we know there's a need, so that's already established. There's already, you know, intellectual property that's been developed around it and then finding, you know, innovative companies that could come in and bridge, you know, getting funding, additional funding to then uh, commercialize and take it to, uh, to the market, to the consumers. And, and this is an area I, I know most lay people don't really realize how much this actually happens right. in, in, in collaborations between, in creative specifically, between the government and, and small businesses specifically. But that, that's fantastic. So, Absolutely. So, I would just like to say, I, I, would, I would add that from a technology developer perspective in the government, this is an incredible opportunity to make that leap over the technology valley of death, as it's known, as something <laughs> gets developed to this this point, it needs commercial hardening and development, you know, and that's not something that we can necessarily get funding to do here. So, right. and not only would it be better to be working with a commercial partner just for that, but also just expanding the utility of this. This is purpose built for the warfighter, but like you said, it's also good for the first responder, maybe good in other austere environments where individuals need a presumptive ID for a disease or you know something in the environment. Well, so that, by working together, 
w this this technology can go even farther. Well, absolutely, and, and just to, ex uh, to build upon what you were saying, CBC is built to be a research facility, right? So we are here for mm -hmm. the 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 idea, the concept, and the beginning, right? We and then we can partner with folks um, across both government and private industry to move these things forward while our researchers can turn around and go back and, and look for solutions to, to other things, right? And, and exactly. look for other type of areas where we can support the warfighter. So it's really important to understand that, you know, we need to get it to a point and then work with the right people to get it into the hands of the people that need it the most. Exactly. That's fantastic. So, so, so one last question for you yeah. both, and, and this is kind of a broad question, but it very, very important. So, so what's next? I mean, how do we push this further? Like both from the research point of view in the areas where we're looking to move, like I said, move to next. Mm -hmm. And then for you, you know, what are the long-term goals? Jen, for, what's next for sure. the research side so of this? So what's next for PDP? Not only can we put in um, tried and true assays, mm -hmm. but we develop assays here at CBC as part sure. of our, our daily business. Not only uh, antibodies, better an antibody-like reagents for mm -hmm. these type of assays, but other molecular assays like <clears throat> isothermal amplification. So it's basically PCR, people have heard of that, right. uh, at one temperature. And so that allows someone who's in the field to maybe have that assay with them in a pouch and maybe the one temperature is one of uh, um, the heating devices that you can oh. have, the hand warmer devices, yeah, yeah. right? That kind of idea. So we're working, we would like to be working on new assays that could go into a, a pocket detection pouch or That's other platforms. And you had also mentioned that you're talking about integrating this with a, another uh, invention. Yeah, like so invention one, of, <clears throat> one of the things that we learned from the warfighters, not everyone collects samples the same way. So that's actually why we didn't in build in a collection device for the pouch. We left it just open. A lot of people use swabs. Other people, you maybe have a dropper. We have another homegrown uh, detection device. This is called the Mono, developed by some of our colleagues here. And this is a sponge on a bag. Essentially, it's another kind of Ziploc bag <clears throat> concept. So you can peel this open. It's a moistened uh, sponge and you can swab an area. But what I really like about this is that you can then turn it inside out, zip up your sample that is now inside the bag, keep it safe, and then through a lure lock, a really common lock for in the medical industry, if we could connect these two, I think oh. it would be a really nice sort of collection and detection package that could go easily together, and also it weighs essentially nothing. And easily disposable too. Easily so once disposable. You're done, you can you can discard, discard, discard it, it very safely. easily. Yep. Absolutely. So that's that's one of the other other areas that we'd like to work on. That's fantastic. And it, so Yusuf, talk to me a little bit about what's next for you and your company. Yeah. No. Look. Um, you know, because now we've built that relationship, have it created in place. These are all the innovative ideas. You know, as we develop the product, make it more robust. Um, it's all going to be collaborative to figure out, you know, what the new warfighters need downrange. And so, yeah, we're committed to making sure that at least the first iteration of the product gets commercialized and then start thinking about uh, how we make it better, you know, and, and make it more robust. So we've been in conversations with some renditions of what the next version would look like past once we get it commercialized. Right now our goal is the next six to 12 months to get this in in commercial hands, at least in the, in the active duty military arena, and then some of the first responder firefighters area. So that's what we're focused on on the commercialization part, commercialization plan, development plan. We've already reached out to some of the suppliers for these plastics, you know, the lateral flow companies, and then we're gonna collaboratively work. I'll give you an example, when we first started this communication, we were actually thinking about using quantum dots for the lateral flow. So yeah. what's quantum dots? So quantum dots is your QLED, <laughs> the Samsung, the, the bright lights, those red, yellow, the, yeah. the color. Yeah, those are quantum dots that are in the TVs, the most advanced TVs, the Samsung. Okay. Uh, we had reached out to the company uh, that produces those, but they were in UK. So that's why we weren't able to commercialize the first rendition of this because those get rapid, uh, ultraviolet light hits those, it could bind to the S1, S2 protein at the time and give uh, a reading. Oh, wow. So a red and green that was conjugated by the scientists uh, produced a, a, a yellow. 
uh, Illuminate, and they were actually testing it in the lab. We were trying to get that the quantum dots to be used in, in, in the pocket detection pouch. However, because we were in a shutdown mode, those are like the options that we will have. Go to Samsung and the company that they're partnered with and using some of those innovative solutions to get that, you know, go from 15 minutes to maybe five minutes. Wow. As, as rapid as, as what we call pocket detection pouch and rapid detection, because uh, that's something that medics need, right? And yeah. uh, so I'm always thinking in the line of a medic, because I was a medic downrange, and so the quicker we could get answers to things, whether it's, you know, a quick pulse read or a quick detection of whatever chemicals is there, that's my goal for the, you know, this version and future version of the pocket detection pouch. That's, that's fantastic. That's, that's wonderful. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, I want to thank you both, Dr. Sikowski, Youssef, for joining me here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. <laughs> for CB Defense Today uh, and the U.S. Army DevCom Chemical Biological Center, I'm Jack Bunja. <laughs>